Oh, sorry, let me go through that one more time. You'll recall, we just did the calculation earlier that the solar constant, when you distribute it over the hemisphere of the Earth that's illuminated by the sun, you end up getting a distribution of 1.8 times 10 to the 17 watts over that half of the sun, half of the Earth. The whole surface area of the Earth is given by this one here. Now, I say Earth atmosphere system because we take about 6,371 kilometers as the approximate radius of the Earth. And we add about 100 kilometers of atmosphere on top of that to give us our Earth atmosphere radius. But when you distribute that energy over this surface area, the total shortwave radiation energy in is 341 watts per square meter. So we have the shortwave component and uh, 341 watts per square meter coming in to the Earth atmosphere system. 79 watts is reflected back into space by clouds and stuff in the atmosphere. 78 watts is also absorbed by the atmosphere. And 20, further 23 watts per square meter is reflected by the Earth's surface on average across the whole globe. So when you add up the reflected components, it's 30 percent of the incoming shortwave radiation is reflected back into space. 47% of that then is absorbed uh, by the Earth's surface, 161 watts per square meter. It's absorbed as short wave, but it's emitted as long wave. So when we talk about the uh, component of the emitted long wave radiation leaving Earth's surface, it's 160 watts per square meter. 40 watts per square meter is emitted from Earth directly into space. That's this path here. 23 watts per square meter is emitted by the Earth, at the atmosphere to the surface. And 17 watts per square meter is emitted by the surface as sensible heating. 80% is in the latent heating or the, the evaporative component of uh, evaporating um, from the land surface and uh, transpiration from trees. So that leaves about one watt per square meter that's just observed, absorbed by the earth. And of that 239 watts per square meter leaving the earth atmosphere system, that 40 watts per square meter emitted from the surface to space, 169 emitted from the atmosphere and that's 30 watts per square meter emitted by clouds. So the stuff that eventually turns into clouds re-emits 30 watts per square meter. Now this is all averaged in time and space, but the general idea is energy in equals energy out. As it's leaving in the longer wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, it's long wave radiation, uh, that, that can be modeled by a, what we call the uh, black body radiation or Stefan Boltzmann's law, where the long wave radiation energy out is equal to the emissivity of the object, a physical constant called Stefan Boltzmann's constant, and the temperature of the object raised to the power of four. So the emissivity is the ability for an object to emit what it has absorbed. Uh, a perfect black body, black body will emit everything that it absorbs. Um, most objects, however, on Earth are not perfect black bodies. So um, they will emit something less than 100% of what they absorb. So this uh, emissivity, epsilon, is a value less than one on Earth for most objects. Uh, as the, the Earth as a whole, um, if you add up all the various you know, land cover types, oceans, um, clouds, on average, the whole Earth has an emissivity of about 0.6. Um, I can tell you those soil surfaces have about a 0.9 emissivity. So 90% of what Earth's uh, soil surfaces absorb, they re-emit. Uh, in the Earth's case, it's about 61%. So given the emissivity of the Earth is 0.61, the average temperature of the Earth is uh, about 15 degrees Celsius, we get a long wave radiation component leaving Earth of 239 watts per square meter.
energy in equals energy out. That 30% reflected back into space. Um, again, that's a over all land cover types, over the whole Earth on average, uh, about 30% is reflected back into space. That, that reflected word uh, is also called an albedo. Uh, in this case, it's the planetary albedo. So that's that fraction of incoming solar shortwave radiation that's reflected back into space. Um, monitoring the albedo was really the kickstart of the modern satellite meteorology uh, program. And, and uh, thanks to um, some pioneering scientists in the uh, 60s uh, and the 1960s, um, we have a, a dedicated environmental monitoring program using satellites thanks to the interests of scientists back in the 1960s on monitoring changes in planetary albedo. Because it was recognized that by monitoring changes in planetary albedo, we can monitor changes in Earth's radiation budget. Um, and that's important for making decisions about climate change and uh, how we might deal with it. So energy out equals energy in. Um, the energy in is shortwave radiation uh, given by this. We can use, and then the energy out is by Stefan Boltzmann's law. We can equate these two, giving all the parameters that we've just come up with, and find that it would, would be a relatively simple exercise for you to demonstrate that a small change in the albedo of the Earth can result in a change of the Earth temperature by one Kelvin. Um, and that's important. Because if we are arguing that a, uh, by having more um, aerosols in the atmosphere, for example, aerosols lead to greater cloud cover, greater cloud cover leads to greater planetary albedo, that reduces the global temperature by about a Kelvin or one degree Celsius. So it's important to monitor the planetary albedo. Now that's over everything we've just talked about in radiation budgets over the long term. Uh, the long uh, averaged over a longer time period, averaged over um, multiple land cover types across the whole globe. Um, generally, we measure these things more local in local time frames and, and, and local um, areas. Um, and so, when we see that uh, sunrise to sunset, incoming solar radiation uh, looks like this distribution here. And what we can see then that as the sun rises uh, to local noon, um, the temperature of the uh, atmosphere above the um, uh, above, well, above that surface increases, but there is a lag. So at solar solar noon, it's the peak in shortwave radiation. Um, but the resulting peak in emissions, if you're talking about the emitted radiation now in blue, uh, is, is more aligned with the temperature peak, uh, maximum temperature, which is about 3 p.m. So even though the sun, sun's maximum energy output or energy uh, received at the Earth's surface is maximum at noon, uh, we don't see that reflected as a, a heating until about mid-afternoon or 3 o'clock. And then it's a gradual cooling uh, as the sun sets, uh, the, uh, the air temperature gradually decreases and the cycle starts again. So really, there's uh, a whole field of endeavor of uh, micrometeorology, energy balance, land atmosphere interaction that is devoted to understanding what happens to that radiation when it's at the Earth's surface. And when, when it's at the Earth's surface, so we measure, it comes in as shortwave radiation and leaves as long wave. It's the interaction of that radiation with the surface components, uh, be it natural landscapes or uh, urban or city environments, that all, uh, in, that all um, modifies the atmosphere overlying the surface. And so it's important to be able to model it. So we, we talk about the net radiation uh, at the Earth's surface as a function of the net shortwave. So that's the stuff coming in minus the stuff going out. And the net long wave as the stuff coming in, that emitted atmospheric um, uh, long wave radiation that goes 
down to the Earth's surface, uh, minus the stuff that's emitted from the Earth's surface back into space. So this is the net radiation. And understanding how that radiation interacts with different land surfaces and environments is important for understanding how moisture gets from the land surface into the atmosphere. Um, we talk about evapotranspiration. You will have heard of evaporation. That's the uh, conversion of liquid water into a gas. Um, there's also, so that's evaporation, but there's a transpiration. Now, that's the component of the um, uh, moisture that gets into the atmosphere uh, through plants, uh, opening their pores and releasing moisture. They open their pores, of course, because they want to take in CO2. That's what they breathe in. They exchange uh, that with oxygen and, and moisture escapes through their pores. So the, the pores are called stomata. So uh, moisture getting from the, pl the plant's uh, foliage into the atmosphere is through transpiration. The combined effect of the evaporation and transpiration is called evapotranspiration. So solar radiation at the Earth's surface is, is going to heat up the underlying land and, the, and that has a result of uh, heating up the overlying atmosphere. Um, that heating of the land surface pumps moisture into the atmosphere, but that, heat, that shortwave radiation leads to photosynthesis. So um, that processing of sh solar radiation, the um, opening of the, the pores to take in the CO2, uh, the solar radiation, the CO2 uh, converting the, um, the, those into starches and sugars that plants love, um, that all happens when solar radiation hits the Earth's surface. Um, and the whole study of land atmosphere interactions is a, an active one. It's a critical one for understanding uh, the Earth's system and its components. Uh, and we introduce that in our next lecture. So for now, I'll leave you with these key concepts from today that solar radiation uh, comes in the form of electromagnetic radiation over the 0.3 to about a micron uh, shortwave radiation. So Earth's ra solar radiation comes into the Earth's system as shortwave radiation. Uh, as it propagates through the atmosphere, it interacts with its constituents, it's absorbed, it's scattered, um, reflected, uh, emitted by the atmosphere, uh, comes in a shortwave, leads as long wave, and 30% of the stuff that comes in is reflected back into space at the Earth's surface partition the net radiation as net short wave and net long wave and that helps define our land atmosphere interactions which is the topic of our next lecture and that's thank you for your time and i'll see you next time